Thank you very much. Well, that, that was a great intro because I think what I'm trying to do with this talk is to bring all of those strands together in uh, into a single thread uh, over the next 25 minutes. So let's uh, share my screen here uh, so that you can see my slides um, and, and get started. So my start point for this is to is to claim that there's this emerging um, separate strands of intelligence that are, are in the world today. Now, this has already has started 30 years ago when I started doing this, but uh, but it's fragmented further in in the exciting um, advances in AI in the last year, because my claim is that there are now basically three kinds of of intelligence that are in widespread use out there. There is uh, statistical AI, as I'm going to call it, which is the kinds of things that uh, ChatGPT uh, uh, and uh, other large language models are doing and other generative AI approaches. You could also think of that as semantic AI. We're trying to um, attach kind of conceptual meaning to, to things like images and, and text and process with that. Um, then there is symbolic AI, which is very, very much what I've spent the last 30 years doing, which goes under... Uh, um, other synonyms like computation or algorithmic intelligence. And then separately, there is the one that's always been around, which is human intelligence. And I want to take a little time to, to contrast those uh, before we go into the, the consequences. So let's let's look at each one first in order to understand what we're talking about. That one key observation is that the large language model approach, statistical AI, is it's not intelligence in, or understanding as people as some people are claiming it is in the end doing one very simple task which is statistically to predict words so it's guessing at which words are likely to fit it's looking for its its goal its its only goal is to generate words that seem plausible for the situation now it turns out that the breakthroughs in of the last uh, couple of years have meant that it does that really very very well so the words that follow uh, a question are typically the answer to the question, or the uh, the words that follow a statement can be the explanation of the statement, or they can be the responses that follow an instruction. So this kind of combination of the very short range prediction of uh, that uh, an adverb is near is probably followed by a verb are linked to long range things like the beginning of story uh, having to relate to the end, and and it's made breakthroughs that make the appearance of intelligence. Through uh, through the random generation of plausible words. Now, in contrast, uh, oh, I say, and so, you know, you've, I'm sure you've seen these kinds of examples that give this very kind of fluent human-like uh, um, ability to generate text. So I can give it an instruction like describe Wolf from Alpha in language suitable for a seven-year-old, and it does a really pretty good job of that. But in the end, those are the words that are likely to have followed such a uh, request. And likewise, uh, asking it to explain something given some prompt, these are the, this is the kind of explanation that you would expect to follow, and it's generated words that really do seem to answer that question very well. Now, I contrast that against what I think of as symbolic AI as being uh, you know, much more deterministic. It's defined rules of behavior for structured inputs. So what do I mean by that? If you think about a number as being a, a structured input. It's a very concrete, a meaningful uh, piece of, you know, if I do two plus two, two is a very meaningful uh, piece of symbolic content that it represents this sort of notion of quantity. And there are very defined rules for that two plus two will equal four. And the way that you add in columns or uh, whatever that allows you to compute any addition or multiplication or much more complicated kinds of uh, computational behavior. But it's all taking something that's much more clearly defined and applying very precise rules of behavior to those to those inputs. So very different from the probabilistic what seems like it will fit that generative AI tries to do. Now, of course, that world is very large. And you know, I've spent 30 odd years uh, helping to build out uh, the Wolfram language and Mathematica, our software technologies that and things like Wolfram Alpha that join these things up and implement them because there's the zoo of of computation that's been developed in all kinds of disciplines is really big. So that's things like 
classical statistics, but it's also things like geographic and geodesic computations. It's graphs and networks and relationships and flows. It's uh, it's time related things like seasons and uh, and uh, trends. It's things like finding the best values, optimization, and and there's all kinds of structured data like audio and video input or textual input that all have their rules of computation about. Um, uh, about what words mean and synonyms. And then there's this collection of scientific things that every discipline has its own very specialized computations. Um, and likewise, there's lots uh, of engineering where a lot of this computation basically started in the world of physics um, and engineering to solve those kinds of uh, design or scientific problems, but it's spread into all kinds of different disciplines in the world. Um, and I, I, I class into this group as well, things like machine learning, uh, even though that is the basis of the large language models, the way that we build machine learning models is all very uh, much in the world of computation um, in order to build these kind of um, models that then have the emergent behavior of the large language models. So what's interesting um, uh, is that when you start thinking through what does intelligence mean and the kinds of things that, uh, that humans used to do that artificial intelligence now seems to be able to do. Um, the, there's, there's very clear distinctions between some of the relative strengths and weaknesses. The computation is really very good at uh, handling complex rules and large language models and humans really aren't. This is why we find it hard to study maths and, uh, and I'll show some examples uh, just to kind of make this clear in a moment. And likewise, things like large data, uh, sort of, um, statistical data science type things, very much the realm of computation. And computation is incredibly reliable. If it works once, it pretty much works the next time. Um, and these things are, are absolutely not true of large language models. But large language models are very good at a range of inputs. They can be human-like. They can contextualize things somewhat. They can deal with unstructured data somewhat. Um, and you know, at a diminishing level, there's a sort of level of creativity and even some strategic awareness, but it, they're very much fading out as we go down towards the bottom. Um, now, we're in the beginning of a field and maybe some of these uh, gray ticks will fill in more, but fundamentally the approach is never going to hit reliability because they're not designed for that. And they're not, re they're only making the sounds of understanding, they're not understanding anything. So humans still have their place. Humans have their extra weaknesses, Humans are terrible with big data, which is why we give so much weight to anecdotes. But there's some things that uh, that we're nowhere close to in terms of the wide range of inputs. You, know, you can put a human in a car and they can drive pretty much anywhere, most of the time not crashing, and we are still nowhere quite uh, close to that, even in, in a field that has had a huge amount of effort into making uh, AI models work. And while AIs make the sounds of emotions, there's no real emotional content there. So there's still very human characteristics that we haven't begun to scratch the surface of. So let me just give a couple of examples to, to make these things clear. Like, it seems like LLMs can handle very complex rules, but but actually, as soon as you give them, you know, there's some great anecdotal examples of things that seem quite amazing, but there's no consistency to it. And actually, when you look closely, their unreliability is, unreliability is really profound in rule-based uh, things even down to the point that they can't count they look like they can count because most of the time you ask it uh, questions so you might have two or three digit numbers that, and it's seen all of the examples of adding numbers and multiplying numbers but as soon as you actually ask it to do something that requires using the rules of arithmetic so here i've asked a slightly uh, more complicated arithmetic question three to the power 45 we get an answer that's wrong. And this is um, this is what I got out of ChatGPT. This is the correct computation, which is utterly trivial to do in a computational world. And in fact, it's worse than it even looks at a glance because it looks like, well, they both began with a two. And uh, so, um, you know, after that, they've gone wrong. But actually, if you count the digits, the uh, LLM version has got about three digit blocks too many. So it's about a thousand million times too big. It's not even in the same ballpark. All it knows is that a question like this is usually followed by a bunch of numbers. And so it gives you a bunch of numbers. That's its job is to be plausible, but it knows nothing about uh, about computation. And as soon as you go anywhere more complicated, like this calculus problem, here's the answer that it gives. Um, I can put the same thing into Wolfram Alpha, and you can see that at first glance they look a bit similar. They both got a quarter in, and they both got sines and coses. Um, 
I guess uh, the, unless there's any British people, you won't know this historical joke of the. Uh, there was an old joke of uh, very that uh, of a 1970s comedy act who had the line of uh, he was playing the piano badly, and the guy says, "You're playing all the wrong notes." And he says, "No, I'm playing all the right notes, just not necessarily in the right order." And that's pretty much the way LLMs do computation: is that the answer has sort of all the right notes in it, but it's because it doesn't understand the relationship between these symbols is just completely different answer. It's just wrong. Now, people think that because LLMs are built with massive amounts of data and seem to know lots and lots of stuff, they must be, you know, that, that they're in the big data world. But they are fundamentally limited by an attention span that is relatively tiny. So this slightly out of date example I did in chat GPT 3.5, uh, I deliberately gave it uh, slightly over 2,000 items and asked it a very simple question, what's the last number in the list? And it can't answer it. And that's because I knew that GPT 3.5's attention span was about 2,000, uh, I think it was 2,048 tokens. And so it simply can't hold a large amount of data. It, it always, is always working on a fairly small amount of attention span, just like a human, uh, where you know, if I gave you this task, you would shortcut it and go straight to the bottom. But if I asked you anything more complicated about, here's a bunch of data, now tell me how many zeros are we in, you'd have, you'd have no way of remembering all of the data. Uh, you're only ever working on snippets. And that's the way that LLMs work as well. Even though the attention spans are growing to something like 100,000 tokens for the state of the art now, that is nothing in data science terms. It's trivial for me to write code that says, uh, let's make uh, 10 million digits and ask for the last number of those uh, in that list of 10 million random numbers. And it can just do it just like that in computational world. Um, now, the, the one thing a lot of people are talking about, but it's only the tip of the iceberg about the re reliability is this hallucination feature. And this is the example I, I grabbed a while ago to use for talks. And I like this not just because this um, answer to the question is wrong. This 33.4 million sheep in Turkey that I asked it about livestock in Turkey isn't, isn't the correct number. But it, this actually illustrates quite nicely the fundamental problem that because they are targeted on plausibility and correctness is a kind of nice side effect of that, not only is it wrong, but it's making an effort to make the kind of noises that would convince me that it's right. So it tells me that it's got this from some reliable source called Turkstat. Well, I was a bit more pedantic and I actually went to Turkstat and after a little while I found the right page. And you can see that Turkstat is a real thing, that it's the Turkish government statistics bureau, but the number isn't correct. So it was just a lie to say that it got this number from Turkstat. Um, beautifully fluent, but it can't be trusted on, on things that are quite detail oriented. Anything computational, it tends to forget numbers. Um, it's, it's good in broad strokes, but not in anything precise. But something computation has always struggled with is handling unstructured data. So parsing the sentence that we can do as a human very easily, that was really hard until a year ago, just to be able to say how many dogs were mentioned in the following sentence and to be able to piece that together is kind of an amazing step forward. So we've got fundamental different approaches and fundamental different weaknesses that however much either improve unless a completely new idea comes along, um, they kind of are ir irreconcilable strengths and weaknesses. So from a technical level, and my day job is very much this, is to try and figure out how can we combine uh, the best of each of these. That we want to, I, you know, we're doing a lot of work with engineering, uh, and this is why we've been very involved with uh, people like OpenAI, is because uh, we come along with this sort of computational world that we've been building for 30 years. People like OpenAI and Anthropic and uh, Google are, are filling in uh, great advances in the large language model world. But the engineering challenge is to try and build systems that, uh, that, that put the best of both worlds together. And we can extend that idea to say, well, you know, um, how do we put the best of humans together uh, uh, with the best of these automated intelligences? And this is where I want to take a slight pivot. That's the background of what's changed in my worldview. But let's talk a little bit more now about the consequences. And we're, we've been on this journey for a while that the value of intelligence has, has changed during our lifetimes. That there were a lot of things where human intelligence was extremely valuable 
for being able to solve problems, do things, make the world a better place, that now uh, is is not so is not as important as it used to be. The internet, uh, to, well, computers started this, of course, by being able to deal with uh, things like arithmetic. That it used to be, we employ people just to add up numbers and uh, to you know keep ledgers uh, correct, and just doing that counting for us suddenly became trivial. The internet has reduced the value of knowledge. It is not so important to know a lot of things. You've got to know about things. You've got to know what things you don't know to know that you can look them up. But I can, you know, in a way that was unimaginable when I was a child, I can know almost anything from my phone in seconds. You know, we watched television and said, who's that? I guess we'll never know because you just there was no way of looking up who was in a film until credits came up at the end. And now that kind of knowledge is always at everyone's fingertips uh, in any uh, developed nation. We spend a lot of time reducing the cost of process, that if you're doing things that require figuring out the best value of things or or, um, uh, or you know, calculating routes, all of these kinds of things that are step-by-step rule-based processes, those are trivially cheap to do now. We don't need to uh, have banks of human computers as we once had in engineering companies um, uh, whose job would just to work out stresses and strains on things for, for engineers doing design work. That is now trivially cheap. And the NLM world has now reduced the cost of words. Words are now cheap. And even simple decisions, if you're just doing things like triaging, which is the right person to deal with this email, that kind of level of decision-making is now incredibly cheap. So a lot of these things we feel like we value in humans are becoming much less valuable because they're being undermined by the commoditization of certain types of intelligence. So what is human intelligence is value? What's left? Well, I, I put it down to these uh, three things. Strategy is still beyond uh, the LLMs. Being able to say, what's our tool set and how are we gonna go about putting them together? What's our goal? What, what do we want to achieve? And what's our strategy for getting there? This really much higher level abstracted kind of thinking is still the, for now the preserve entirely of humans. I put creativity on here as well, but because even though there is a level of creativity that is now really automated, if you want to do graphic design type things and you want to make a magazine cover photo, um, these generative image tools are pretty amazing at that and styling things. But really that's the artisanship of, of creativity, not the art. Uh, if you get GPT to write, I've, I've done this exercise, it's, it's kind of fun. You get GPT to write the script for a film. And I came up with an adventure film. It gave me a plot. It came up with some ideas. It wrote the script. When I looked, reflected on it, it was really very generic. But then I put on the TV to relax and I watched an adventure film that was really pretty generic. So one of the things we have to realize is a lot of things we mark up as creative industry actually are not very creative. They're just wheeling around stereotypes. And that end of creativity is being challenged, but not true creativity of new ideas. And in the end, just good judgment that comes from humans ability to adapt to any situation and use some knowledge you have from childhood that seems irrelevant but have learned something for, to the situation today that kind of recontextualization is still limited to humans but here's the problem when you look at education we now pivot to the thing that i really want to change here is that what we're teaching in school are mostly facts and processes the two things that are most diminished by the rise of technology that, uh, you know, I, I remember all kinds of uh, kings and queens of England, and I uh, know how to work out all kinds of uh, mathematical things or physics problems, but they were all facts and processes. Um, and I, I've listed here artistic creativity, which is good, but there's no real creativity in other subjects, which, you know, we have this idea that Art and music are the places to learn creativity, not STEM subjects, for example. So there's a complete gap, gap um, in sort of other kinds of creativity, although we are doing not a bad job in, in some. Now, this is a, what I'm talking about here, I think affects all subjects in education. My personal expertise is, is myths. And um, this is where I put a lot of my thinking in. Um, I co-founded computerbasedmath.org which is an organization to try and rethink what maths or uh, a replacement for maths, some kind of computational thinking curriculum should look like. Um, go to the website here if you want the long version of this or um, Conrad Wolf and my colleague's uh, book, The Maths Fix is the very long version and is a, is a thoroughly uh, good read. I'm gonna give you the, the uh, 
the five minute version. So if we think about maths, you gotta start with the question, what does it mean to do maths? And we break this down into four steps. Defining a question, like what am I trying to figure out? What do I know? What don't I know? What am I, um, you know, what is the kind of answer I'm looking for and maybe the kind of maths that might help. Then there's a sort of translational step, which is I've decided I'm gonna use equations. How do I turn my real world problem into a set of equations that now are structured objects ready for computation? And then there's a kind of computational step where you solve the equations or optimize them or whatever the step is. And then we're gonna figure out what that means. How do we translate that back to the real world? Is it plausible? Do I believe it? Can I verify it? Does it raise new questions and send me around the loop again? And here's what you find if you look at uh, the way we do maths education is that almost all of the effort is on the hand calculating step, that, that actually solving the equation step, which is totally backwards because that's the one bit or the main bit that computers have made completely automated for, for many years now. And with LLMs, they're starting to make inroads into the translate to maths. But the strategy step and the contextualization step, which are the preserve of humans, we don't teach at all. And our answer is simple. We say we should use computers. We should assume they exist for all of the actual computation, just like they do in the real world. And we should use humans' uh, uh, time in the classroom to learn how to do the other steps of doing maths. So let's take an example here. This is uh, this was actually controversial because it was claimed to be a bit hard in the Scottish higher exam. And here's a typical, um, you know, 17, 18 year olds question which tells us a little story about crocodiles chasing zebras, and then it gives us a formula for the time it takes, and we're asked to do certain things on it. So the problem-solving part of it, the interesting human part, that's not here at all. It's not how are we going to figure out how long crocodiles will take. That's all been done. It's a, it's a nice story to try and give us some context, but actually the crocodiles and zebras are irrelevant to the story. Uh, we've squashed out any real-world detail of uh, you know, this water flow. Does it? Is it? Is it a complex flow? Is there obstacles? The real world is complex, and it's reduced it down to this abstraction that has been done for me. So I'm just presented with an equation. We could forget the rest, and what we need to do is uh, the steps. I uh, I need to uh, figure out. It doesn't travel on land. I just have to figure out that means uh, that um, uh, that x should be twenty. And uh, the shortest distance possible, or sorry, doesn't, oh, uh, I forget which way around we're substituting, but I just substitute two values and then I have to simplify the equation. And then I have to do some derivative to uh, remember that that's the way you optimize maximums is to solve for the derivative equals zero. Um, just to save a bit of time, I did this uh, just while I was setting up beforehand. I pasted this into a Mathematica chat notebook, literally copy and pasted the question. And through this combination of large language model abstraction and uh, somewhere in here, there are sort of mathematical computations where it's written some Wolfram language programming code to say, solve the derivative of that equation. Um, it's come up with our answers. The problem is entirely solved by pasting it into a combination of computation and, um, and LLM. And in fact, if you look at this systematically, we did a full A-level, the kind of gold standard exam for maths for 18 year olds with the combination of computation and LLM bound together, it got 96%. The 4% it dropped were easily fixed with a prompt from the user, user saying, no, it means something more like this. So it, all it took was one line hints to fix the other 4%. It's completely game over for the things we're teaching people to be able to do because they are entirely automated by computer. And I want to make a quick point here that, that people often get mixed up about. Computers definitely have changed the way we can teach maths, but what I'm talking about here is the subject. We are teaching the wrong subject because we are teaching people to be computers, not to use computers. And the next reaction I get from most people is, well, then you're just dumbing it down. Uh, somebody called it um, uh, sat-nav mathematics or uh, autopilot mathematics or something when we were arguing this. But let's just analyze for that for a moment. In the real world, maths is used more widely on more complex problems than at any time in history. If you go back to the 1940s or 50s, people were not modeling world pandemics uh, using maths. They were not doing uh, computational biology 
And the reason for that is computers, that the ability to handle much more complicated problems is what has made maths useful in subjects outside of engineering and physics, where there are often very useful solutions that can be very tightly encapsulated as an equation or a differential equation. The use in these other subjects is down to the fact that we can do more complicated maths before uh, because of the computers. And the other thing is that by freeing up that time, we can actually study more maths that, you know, in my day job helping people solve uh, problems, I am touching on all kinds of different maths that I almost entirely learned while working at Wolfram because nobody ever taught me how to do, uh, um, you know, mixed integer, um, real multivariate constraint optimization, because it's really hard. But it's a tool of the mathematics world. And in fact, many of the concepts that we we consider advanced, like calculus, they're only advanced because they're ordered by the complexity of doing the calculation. Before you can do derivatives, you need to understand limits, you need to understand algebra. Well, no, you don't need to be able to do all of these things to be able to understand the concept of a rate of change. And once you've got the concept of an equation and you've got the machinery automatically, you can do very advanced calculus when you're maybe 10 or 11 years old, not wait until you're 16 or 18. So in fact, the current education system is the dumbed down world. It's not the other way around. And the question that, of course, a lot of kids will say is, when will I ever use this when they're studying abstract maths? And now some of that's um, awkward teenage rebellion, but actually more and more it's true because apart from arithmetic, most real world problems cannot be solved in the maths that we actually teach in school. In school, we teach you how to solve a quadratic equation, order two. Linear and order two equations, that's all we teach. We teach nothing about how to solve uh, an equation that's order 17 or, or a system of equations with 10,000 unknowns. Nothing very useful is solvable with a quadratic or a simple uh, linear system of two variables, which is the, the extent at which we teach. And so actually to do real world problems, you need more complicated maths than you ever learn in school. And my contextualization thing because the real world uses the computer to achieve more complex problems, you end up with the zebra problem where you actually have to remove any realistic context in order to make the, the math simple enough to be able to do on pencil and paper in school. So we've made it simultaneously dumbed down in more limited concepts and very small scale problems and made it less useful because the actual maths doesn't, you know, the concepts apply, but the, the maths we learn to do uh, isn't used in the real world. Now, I'm overrunning a bit, so I'm going to skip over this uh, maths education mistakes and just talk about where we want to get to. Um, I think the the thing that we have to think about is that we're not workers anymore. More and more, and this is not just in maths, but it is, is particularly true in maths, it's not our job to do the work anymore. We are managers, and we are managers of the computer because as the computers get more intelligent and also they get... You know, just like humans, they start becoming things that can do so enough complicated behavior that you have to think about directing them and checking what they're doing and organizing them. And so our role now is to, just as a manager has to take experts in their team who may be able to do things they can't and organize them to achieve results together as a team, we have to take these, learn how to manage the intelligences that computers can provide. And it's a fool's errand to try and compete with that automation. Um, in almost every place where we've tried to automate things, automation very quickly becomes better than humans. And we're definitely at that place in mathematics where um, I spent at least a year of my life practicing uh, symbolic integration. And I can trivially write down a calculation that I can do in a fraction of a second on the computer that I was never able to do. Uh, we'll always be outstripped. So we have to think about what we actually do want to achieve from outcomes. And we have a list I'd encourage you to look at uh, on our Computer Best Math site. This was an interesting exercise for us when we got to this part of our project. We said, well, let's look at the outcomes in the world. And the outcomes, if you look at each educational system, are always disappointingly the same thing. There is a vague ambition that says problem solving. We want people who can problem solve. But actually, there is nothing in the specs of maths that teaches problem solving. Uh, that just sort of happens magically by some side effect. Or the spec is down in the minutiae of must be able to complete the square on a quadratic or must be able to represent a mixed fraction as a as a um, 
as a topper fraction and things like this, very precise mechanical reproducible steps. And we've thought through a list of about 10 dimensions that actually are nothing to do with any of those that nobody else seems to have thought about. They're obvious to us as people who work in maths. And let's just stop on one of these, like, like within, uh, I don't know, um, uh, let's say, critiquing and verifying. It's like, we need people to have strategies to tell if the computer's giving you the right answer. You know, sometimes there is bugs, but sometimes it's just a, the data is wrong or that your conceptualization is wrong. We never actually teach how do you critique and verify. All I was taught in maths at school was uh, if the answer was simple, if it came out as 2x, you were probably right. If it started becoming some big complicated expression that you couldn't fit on one line of the paper, it was probably going the wrong direction. Well, real world complex problems are complex. Or the question would say that show x equals y. When you got to y, you knew you were, you were right. And when is any interesting problem given to you in the real world where the, the final outcome is already known? So, you know, five different ways of thinking about critiquing is just uh, one of those 10 dimensions. In the end, there's a big gain to be had here because in the same way that literacy helped to make a workforce of the 1800s ready to be workers, to be productive and to be able to contribute to society by being able to stay up to date with the news, some level of computational thinking is sort of today's um, goal of of uh, literacy, a sort of computational literacy for everyone. And you only have to look around at the distrust of experts that comes from the fact that we are presented more and more with model-based decisions where, where people say you should take a vaccine or you should wear masks because the models say so. and But the population is not able to criticize or engage in that those modeling processes or the computations that achieve them and are simply faced with a trust or don't trust uh, situation. And we need a world where people can actually engage in computational thinking and use this power of the computer to be a participants, not to have a world of experts. And you know, if you think pre-literacy, there was an elite of bishops and clergy and royalty and politicians who could read and write, and the rest were disenfranchised. And that's the world we're in now without computational thinking. We've got a population who are disenfranchised not able to understand what's going on because they were given tools that are irrelevant to the modern world. And that's the thing we'd like to fix by rethinking these subjects. So I hope that's given you something to think about and a, um, um, uh, a perspective on the world as, as we've uh, built it up over in our minds over the last few years of working on this subject. Um, I'd love to take questions at this point.